we've identified five core values. We say that we value truth, prayer, authenticity, community, and relationship. And, and, and I want to spend some time over the next few weeks just talking about why those are, are values that we have identified, why they are core to who we are and what we do as a church. So if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, by the way, if you do not have a Bible, we would invite you this morning to just take one of those black Bibles from the pew. Let that be your Bible when you leave this morning. But we're going to open them to the book of 2 Timothy towards the back of the New Testament, chapter 3. And we're going to begin at verse 14. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, beginning at verse, verse 14. The Word of God says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for your word, and we're mindful even this morning that, that it is indeed your word breathed out to us, given to us, that we would have life, that we would know you, that we would walk in righteousness. So, Lord, exalt the truths of your word in our lives this day. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. You know, as a church family, when we say that we value truth, and, and I talked last week about us exalting Jesus and that it is God-centered and word-driven, that really began to open the idea of what it means for us to value truth. When we say that what we do in this place is word-driven, we come to this place because we want to know the living God, we want to experience Him, we want to encounter Him, we want to be changed and transformed by His powerful movement of His Spirit, and we find that as we engage in the very Word of God. And so what you hold in your hand or what you saw on the screen are not just merely words of a book. These truly are the inspired words of God. I mean, it was probably in the late 1990s, I guess, that the song was written. Some of you are just going to shake your head at this, but the song was, What If God Was One of Us, Just a Stranger on the Bus Like One of Us. What would he say? What would he do? And it just caught on. This song was so wildly popular. And, and I want to just remind you this morning, God was one of us, but his revelation has been given fully and completely in the very Word of God. So anyone looking for an encounter and an experience with God, something that would be just life-changing, life-altering, you need to look no further than that book that is on your lap and the words contained therein. All Scripture is God-breathed. Paul used this word. This is a word that he created, and, and, and there's no other use of it in ancient Greek language, but it's literally the combining of breathing and the word God. And so the most literal translation is God breathed. Well, what does that mean? It's that the Word of God is truly inspired. Look with me at 2 Peter chapter uh, 1. At verse 21, the Word of God says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to use just a few big words this morning, but you're all big kids. You can handle it, I'm, I'm sure. When you hear the Word, that the Word of God is God breathed or that it's inspired. These men were carried along by the Spirit of God. A way to explain that theologically is to say that what we believe in is a plenary verbal inspiration of the Scriptures. 
a plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures. And I know some of you are wanting to write that down, but you have no idea how to spell plenary. Some of you don't want to write that down because you know as soon as you walk out these doors, it is going to go out the vacuum and be gone out of your mind. Well, let me just try to explain, unpack what that means just a little bit because I think it is significant for us. When we say that the Word of God is inspired, I don't mean that necessarily Paul was an inspired man. I mean that the Holy Spirit moved through the Apostle Paul and the other writers of the New Testament in such a way that every word he intended to be said and recorded in Scripture was breathed out to them. He used them in a very unique and peculiar way to plenarily, every word, verbally, inspire what has been written and preserved for us so that when you read the Word of God, you don't have to question whether or not it's relevant. You don't have to question whether or not it is contemporary. Does it still hold truth to this day? The eternal, unchanging God breathed out the words to be contained in Scripture, and they've been preserved for us. You can come to the Bible with full assurance. If the inspired word is truly inspired, then we know this, the inspired word is authoritative. And this is a reason that we hold truth to be a core value of who we are and what we embrace as a church family. The culture in which we live is changing, and I don't have to necessarily enumerate all the ways culture has shifted and changed even in the last six months. But we have something that we hold fast to that is authoritative that no matter how fast or how much culture changes, we can say, here's truth. I can anchor my life here because God has spoken and He's spoken authoritatively. He has spoken finally and firmly in the Word of God. And if there is truth that is revealed there, I know beyond any shadow of a doubt it is truth and it holds authority over my life. So when I read something in Scripture... And I read a command like, we are to love our neighbor as ourself. And we hear this story unpacked from Jesus about who is my neighbor. And my neighbor is somebody that I would hold a prejudice against, like these Samaritans, these, these people that aren't like me. I'm supposed to love them. When I read Scripture and I read truth that maybe is confrontational, and maybe that's easy for you, maybe it's difficult, if I read something that I find difficult or hard to embrace, I don't look at it and say, eh, well, I'm just going to move on. If I believe that the Word of God is inspired, if I believe that it is truly the Word of God to me, every instance that it finds me and chastises me, I have to subject and surrender and submit myself to the authority of the Word of God. And I think it's significant that as a church family, we say that we value truth and that we want to be known as a people who hold the Word of God high and that we lift it up as exalted because I want you to know that around this community, around this state, and certainly around the nation, there are churches who have abandoned the authoritative stance of the Word of God. And they would take sections and parts of Scripture and say, well, that was just for that culture at that time, and it really is not relevant to us today. And so as soon as you begin to marginalize a portion of the Word of God, you've marginalized all of the Word of God. It is authoritative if it is inspired, and, and indeed it is. And the, the inspired Word of God is not only authoritative, it is also inerrant. And I... I don't think that's a big word. It just means it contains no error. So when God gives a verbal plenary inspiration of the Bible and every word that he intended to be recorded has been given and been transmitted and the authors of Scripture are writing the very words of God, he didn't make a mistake. As a matter of fact, I think perhaps the most uh, clear side of the authority and the inerrancy of the Bible is when Jesus is speaking in, in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says that not one jot or one tittle of the law will fade away. Not one speck, not one mark, nothing will pass until 
the word of God is filled till God accomplishes all of his purpose. There's not a mistake in the word of God. It is inerrant. But thirdly, we would say it is sufficient. And, and this is where I really want to spend some time camping out and, and just walk through that text again. In verse 17, it says that all that about the word of God in verse 16, in verse 17, it says that the man of God may be complete. Prepared for every good work. The word of God is sufficient to prepare you to be used of God. So last week, when I'm talking about, I'm, I'm excited because now you're going to go out and you're going to live this out. You're going to be a people who serve people. You're going to be a people who exalt Jesus. And some of you were excited and some of you were maybe just a little bit scared and saying, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm really prepared. I don't know if I'm adequate. I don't know. I might mess it up when I try to exalt Jesus. And I want you to know the Word of God is what prepares you, what equips you, makes you competent, makes you complete, ready to be used by God. Now, let's just walk through verse 16 again. It's not going to be on the screen, but as I said last week, I know it's still in your Bible. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is useful for teaching, for reproving, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. When the Word of God says it's sufficient, it is sufficient to teach. If you want to know more about God and and how to live for Him, how to walk in this life of righteousness... Believe it or not, but what you do not need is a pastor to stand in a pulpit and tell you how to do that. If you want to know how to live for God and you want to know how to, how to truly know Him and intimately become acquainted with Him, you don't need good preaching. You don't even need a powerful worship experience. What you need is the breathed out Word of God taking residence in your heart and in your life. I've said it before and I'll say it again and hear me plainly. There is nothing, not one thing that will replace your time and the Word of God in maturing you and growing you in Christ. There's nothing that will replace your time in the Word of God maturing you and equipping you in your walk with God. Now, it's great to subscribe to podcasts and listen to sermons when you're exercising. Think it's great. Find some good preaching because you don't always get it here. Listen to the Word of God. But I'm telling you, your private time, Opening the Word of God, your time that you set aside and say, Lord, I want to hear from you. There's nothing that will replace that. The Word of God is useful for teaching. You want to know who God is? Open His Word. He's revealed Himself fully. You want to have a powerful encounter with the living God? Then open His Word where He's revealed Himself fully and wholly to you. Open the Word of God and say, Lord, I want to hear from you today and have every expectation that He will be speaking to your heart, to your life, to your situation. It's so encouraging to hear adults, students, children say, you know, I opened the Word of God and, Pastor, it was just like God was speaking to me right then and right there. Even this week, I, there was a student, he said, you know, I was, I was looking for a verse and I couldn't find it and, and I opened here and I just felt like that is exactly what God wanted me to hear. And, and then he shared that passage with me. He said, see, doesn't that just sum it all up? Isn't that, isn't that what we're living for? And I, I mean, he was just fired up. Like, yeah, that's right. There's something about the Word of God that when we open it with an expectant heart, He teaches us and He shows us how to live for Him. Now, it's not just that the Word of God teaches us. And by the way, your word there might be for doctrine. 
And, and literally, it, it's teaching about God. It's doctrine. It's, it's this right revelation about a holy God that we understand Him wholly and completely. And it's contained, that revelation, in the very Word of God. And so, not only is it useful for teaching, for doctrine, to show us and point us to who God is, but it says for reproof, to reprove us. Now, I don't know, but my hunch is that there isn't one person this week that you talked about your life experience and you said, you know, I was really reproved this week. I, 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 it's not a word that we use, right? But you understand what it is? It is what you're doing is not right. It, it is a word of warning. It's a word of reproving is saying you are going the wrong way. Stop. And there are times, friends, when you and I open the Word of God and what we need more than anything is a loving father looking down upon his children and issuing a word of reproof. Have you ever been there where you just open the Word of God and it's like God has just hit you right between the eyes? I I, I don't know how many I can pick on, but we know that the Word of God says, do not be anxious about anything. Ooh. Have you ever just opened the Word of God and come across a passage like that and it just hits you full force? All the weight of the Holy Spirit just, ooh, that's me. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit moves in such a way when we're open to the Word of God that He can reprove us. And He brings a word of condemnation, perhaps. But notice that the Word of God doesn't just stop with a reproof. It's not just the judgmental, this is what's wrong, but with the reproof is always the path for correction. It's, t- it's, it's able to teach us, to reprove us, but it also is given to correct us. Uh, I think of Colossians chapter 2. This isn't in my notes, but I, I just want you to turn there. So Colossians chapter 2 and then verse 3. So, so look at the last part of chapter 2. Because I, in my mind, this is reproof and correction. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why is it as you were still alive in the world do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that perish as they use according to human precepts and teachings. Verse 23, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now, let me try to unpack what Paul's saying. Sometimes when you try to live the Christian life or the religious life, you put all these rules in place. I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to touch that, and I will have nothing to do with this. And if you feel like you've done all those things well, you pat yourself on the back and say, I'm a good Christian, and I've, got, I've done a good job. But what Paul is saying, and, and sometimes this just hits you hard, Being holy isn't about a list of all these don't do this and don't do that and don't touch this and don't do that. You might have the appearance of being religious, but there's nothing that's really changed in your heart. It's, you've never really addressed the sin issue in your life. You've just kind of held back and you're, you're just not going to do those things, but you've never really come to a point where you're going to be holy. Reproof. Awkward chapter break because if you just continued a little bit, he says, verse three, chapter three, verse one, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The correction is, it's not just a list of things that you do and that you don't do. The correction is, set your mind and your affections, your heart on on the things that are above. 
And from the inside out, you're going to be changed. That's when holiness begins to take place. And if you will read through the Word of God, you'll find this reproof and correction, reproof and correction, time and time again. God doesn't just bludgeon you with a hammer and leave you bleeding and saying, oh, I'm so awful. He always points us to a word of correction to bring us back to holiness and to restore us and renew us in our walk with God. We value truth for these reasons. Because we want to know the one true God has revealed himself and we want to live a holy life. So we find him reproving us and we find him correcting us. And it's not only to correct us, but it's then to train us in righteousness. The idea is that when you are living according to the Word of God and you're submitted to its authority and you're, you're understanding its sufficiency in your life that you recognize that if you truly want to be made complete, if you want to be made whole, it's in the Word of God. It trains us. It keeps us on this path. Hebrews 4.12 says it this way, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, to, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God has a way of piercing at the very core of who we are. And it keeps us, it trains us, it maintains us on this road of righteousness. And, and this week... The students who went to camp had an incredible opportunity to hear the Word of God taught faithfully. Ed Newton walked through the book of Revelation, and he, he began in chapter 2, and he began to walk through those letters to the seven churches. There were five nights of preaching, so he covered five of the seven churches. I, I, I want to share with you from some of the students' words of what they sensed God saying and doing as they were exposed to this truth over and over again and, and this truth that penetrates and that cuts to the very heart. One student said, the last two nights I realized that I need to be focused on growing my relationship with God, that I need to keep doing that, and that being saved and baptized isn't close to the end or the finish line with God, but instead it's just the beginning. Isn't that something to rejoice in? Here's a student that says, I want to grow in Christ. Here's another student that says, uh, this week I think God has been telling me that I can depend on Him. This week God showed me that He really is there. I've learned that I can put my trust in Him. I can, I can trust Him through all my struggles and that I'm never alone. I was saved Tuesday night and I can already think of so many ways my life will be different. Isn't that powerful? And this is because the Word of God is being taught faithfully. Now, another student writes, Wednesday was a big day for me. Probably the best day I could ever have. I was listening to the service and it hit me so hard. I finally realized I couldn't help myself on my own anymore and, I, and that I need Him. This is the power of the taught Word of God affecting change in the lives of students. During this week, I feel like God has been telling me to put my full trust in Him and give a 100% of me. God is telling me to get to know Him better and to go to Him with my problems instead of just trying to handle them myself. The Word of God is living and active. We value truth because truth changes lives. And you, church family, were a part of God working in these students' hearts and lives, not only because you sent them and you helped financially to do that, but because I know so many of you were praying this week for students, and you were praying for God to do something great. And, and we say that we value truth, we also value prayer, and you say, well, Pastor, you've been talking a lot about the Word of God, and I saw that first slide, it said, Truth and prayer. Where does prayer fit into this? I don't think you can have an abundant prayer life apart from an indwelling time in the Word of God. I'll just say that again. I don't think you can have an abundant prayer life apart from an indwelling time in the Word of God. One feeds off the other. Look at John chapter 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That is a powerful promise, is it not? 
what we would like to do is we would like to latch on to that, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Yes, Lord, give me that promise. Whatever I want. I'm going to pray really hard right now for a red Corvette to be waiting for me when I leave. Whatever I want. That's really not what it's saying, is it? The first part of that promise is if you abide in me and my words abide in you. There's something about spending time in the Word of God, letting the Word of God dwell richly in you, allowing the Word of God to teach, reprove, correct, and train you. When the Word of God is that active in your life, it begins to shape and change your heart and your affections and your desires so that when you cry out to God, you're crying out for the things that He desires and that He's going to do, and you just begin to experience all the more the powerful working of the Spirit of God in your life because you see Him answering prayer over and over and over again. And as a church family, we say that we value prayer not just because it's something that we do, but we know that without prayer, there's nothing that we can do. I'll say that again. We value prayer not because it's something we can do, but because without it, there's nothing that we can do. Prayer fuels ministry. Prayer is necessary. It is what, it, it is the engine that keeps the church running. The people of God spend time in prayer asking for wisdom and for grace and for, for the powerful movement of the Spirit of God, and we see God answer time and time again. I don't know, church family, if you're aware of this, but we have an incredible prayer ministry and there are members of the prayer team that, that faithfully pray every week. And there's a room that we've set aside for them. And even in this very hour, there's someone in that room that's lifting us up before the throne right now. Asking God to show up. Asking God to do something powerful in this place. We value prayer. Not because it's something we can do, but because there's nothing we can do without prayer. So where does that leave us? What now? What are the next steps? How do, I, how do I leave this place being affected by what you've called as these values of truth and prayer? Well, let me try to give you just a few points of application to take away with you today. Number one, it's plain and it's very clear. If the Word of God has been speaking to you about an issue that needs to be changed in your life, submit to, to His authority right now. Do not delay. And, and for someone in this room, it may be that you have walked into this room, into this place, and you're at church, and you know all of what church is, but there's something stirring in your heart even in these moments that you know your sin and your choices have separated you from a holy God. And you realize even in this very moment as you heard students talking about giving their life to Christ and being changed and that they couldn't do it on their own, you know in this very moment that the authority of God's word over you is that you're a sinner in need of grace and mercy. And, and so maybe the point of application is just plain and simple, that you need to come to the cross and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin and come be Savior and Lord even now. It may be that you settled the issue of salvation some time ago, but if you just think about the Word of God and His authority in your life, you know that there are areas of your Word that don't line up with the Word of God. And even in this moment, you would say, Lord Jesus, I come humbly before you. Forgive me. Settle the issue of the authority of God's Word. That's a point of application. A second is this. If the Word of God is authoritative and it is sufficient, maybe the point of application is to say, Pastor, I'm committing right here, right now. I will be a man. I will be a woman who takes in the Word of God. And, and, I, and I don't mean that you're a man or a woman who picks up, and it's a great book, Jesus Calling, or any of your other devotionals. I mean, you pick up the Bible, the very Word of God, and you're going to say, every day, 
I'm going to commit to hear from God that he would teach me, reprove me, correct me, and train me. I want to walk in righteousness. That is a very serious point of application. And by the way, we've made it very easy for you to read through the Bible in a year. On the Welcome Center right out there are some stapled together pieces of paper, and they have every single day verses that you can read that will take you through the Scriptures in a year. So every day in the Word, if you're looking for it, there it is. A point of application. I want to submit to the authority of God's Word. I want to be a man or a woman who reads and takes in the Word of God. And here's the third point. When was the last time you began to seriously pray for your family, for your church family? When was the last time that you were so indwelled in the Word of God that the prayers of God just began to pour out of your life? I think a third point of application is to say, I want to take seriously this issue of praying. And the way that I can do that most concretely, most specifically, is to pray for my family and to pray for my church family and ask God to move with great power in both my family and my church family. Are you ready? It's one thing to say that we value truth in prayer. It's another thing to embrace them in our lives. So on a church website or a pastor sermon saying, we value truth and we value prayer is very meaningless unless the members of the church say, and I am embracing the value of truth and embracing the value of prayer in my life. When we do that, we'll be a people who make disciples by serving people and exalting Jesus because we've got the issue of truth and prayer settled in our hearts and our lives. So as we begin to respond to God and his word this morning, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning, for the reminder of the the truth that is your word. God, I, I pray right now for some who are fighting, struggling with the authority of your word. God, even in this moment, would you give them a broken and surrendered heart? whether it's to you, Jesus, as Savior and Lord for the very first time, or whether, Lord, it it is just an issue of their life that, that they've held on to, but now they're coming to surrender to you. God, I I pray this morning that you'd move with power, that you would cause your people to be men and women of your word, that there there would be a resolve and, and that there would be an empowering of your Holy Spirit to follow through, to be faithful, to encounter you in your word. And Father, help us to be a a people of prayer, that we would pray for our family and our church family. God, we long for you to move with power in both. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.